What if your body had the fuel but didn't have the keys to unlock it? That's what happens when you don't have insulin. And today we're going to be locking everything that you need to know about it. Let's get started. So let's imagine that your bloodstream is like a giant highway filled with tiny little sugar trucks. The molecules driving these trucks are glucose. They're all cruising around with a really super important job, and that is to deliver energy to your cells so that you can move, think, breathe, really everything. But here's the catch. These trucks can't unload their fuel anywhere that they please. Every muscle, fat, and liver cell has a special garage door, and guess what? That door only opens with a very specific key. And do you know what that key is? It's insulin. When insulin binds to receptors on the surface of those cells, click, that garage door is going to fly open, that glucose is gonna get inside where it's gonna be converted to ATP, and your body's energy currency is created. But what if there's no insulin or the cells ignore insulin? What happens then? Those sugar trucks are just going to keep driving around aimlessly. They can't deliver their goods. So instead of fueling your cells, glucose is going to build up inside of our bloodstream. This is what we like to call hyperglycemia. That means that there's too much sugar in our blood. And this is the hallmark sign of diabetes. There are two main characters when it comes to diabetes. We have diabetes type 1 and diabetes type 2. So what happens in diabetes type 1 is that the pancreas gets taken offline, usually by an autoimmune process, and it stops making insulin altogether. It's like the body fired the garage door company. So even though those glucose trucks are ready to roll, there's just no key to make this happen. That means insulin therapy becomes life-sustaining, not just supportive. Every dose replaces something that the body can no longer make. And then we have the opposite when it comes to type 2 diabetes. In this situation, the pancreas still makes insulin, sometimes even more than usual at first. But over time, the cells stop listening. Their insulin locks become old, rusty, and jammed. That is referred to as insulin resistance. The key is there, but the garage door remains shut. The result? Glucose continues to pile up inside of our bloodstream and your cells start feeling starved and sluggish. Over time, this can actually wear on the pancreas, causing more long-term damage to our blood vessels, nerves, eyes, and kidneys, and there's also an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. But here's the deal. Insulin isn't just for type 1 and type 2 diabetes. There's also other situations where insulin really shines. First up, we have gestational diabetes. So what happens is, is that during pregnancy, the placenta produces hormones, and these hormones can make the body more resistant to insulin. If our pancreas isn't able to keep up with the demand, blood sugar is going to rise, and we're going to have gestational diabetes. In this situation, insulin may be prescribed to protect both mom and the baby from further complications. Then we have DKA and HHS. In both diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, blood sugar is extremely high. DKA often happens in type 1 diabetes. Without insulin, the body starts breaking down fat for fuel, creating acidic byproducts like ketones, which can make the blood dangerously acidic. In the case of HHS, this usually occurs in type 2 diabetes. In this situation, blood glucose skyrockets and the body becomes severely dehydrated from that fluid loss. Insulin is given to reverse that sugar overload, stop ketone production, and restore balance. And lastly, something that people don't usually associate with needing insulin is hyperkalemia, meaning that we have too much potassium in our blood. Yes, that's right. It is a surprise fact, insulin can help regulate potassium. It actually activates the sodium potassium pump in our cell membranes. This pump is going to pull potassium inside the cells and lower the levels found in our blood. So in an emergency, like when we see high potassium inside of our blood, insulin is going to be given alongside glucose to buy us a little bit more time while other treatment options are working. Are you ready to race? Let's talk about the five types of insulins that are going to be sorted by their speed. Think of these types of insulin like cars on a track. Some are going to zoom by really, really fast, and others are going to take a little bit longer time. 
Each type is going to have a different onset, meaning how fast it starts, peak, when it works the hardest, and duration, how long it's going to last. And here's something that is super duper important when it comes to test day and of course real life nursing. All types of insulin can be given subcutaneously. That means that it's going to be injected just under the skin using either a syringe or an insulin pen. But a couple of these can go the extra mile. Rapid acting insulin can actually be given through an insulin pump. And when it comes to our short acting insulin, this is the only insulin that can be given intravenously or IV. Now let's break down how each one of these types works on our body. First up, we have our rapid acting insulins, and these are gonna end with LOG. So these are our sprinters. They are gonna act quickly, perfect for controlling blood sugar spikes right after meals. These insulins need to be given right before or just after a meal. If it's given without food, it can actually cause hypoglycemia really fast. Remember, hypo means low. It means we're going to have low sugar in our blood. So this insulin is going to begin usually somewhere around 5 to 15 minutes. It's going to peak somewhere in that 30 minute mark, and it can last anywhere from 3 to 5 hours. So the administration of this one is really easy, right? All of them we can give sub Q, but this is the only one that we can give via an infusion pump. So if we have somebody who needs insulin around the clock, this would be the go-to medication for that. So common examples of these insulins are going to be Novolog, Humalog. Remember, anytime we're looking at a rapid type of insulin, it is going to end in log. And then we have one that doesn't end in log but still falls within this category, and that is called glucoline. Next up, we have our short-acting insulin, also known as our regular insulin. So these types of insulins are going to end in R. So the way I like to remember it is that R stands for regular, and R also stands for right into the vein because this is the only one that you can give intravenously. So these guys are our reliable runners. They're not as fast as our rapid acting, but they still are quick enough for mealtime blood sugar control, as well as IV use in case of emergencies. So here's our big clinical pearl. When we're giving this medication IV, we really need to be monitoring those blood glucose and potassium levels regularly because what does insulin do? Insulin is going to shift potassium into the cells and if it shifts enough into the cells this can lead to hypokalemia. So these guys are going to start about 30 minutes so a little bit slower than our rapid acting. They're going to peak somewhere in that two to three hour mark and they're going to last a total of six to eight hours. Administration is key here as we know all insulins can be given subcutaneously but this is the only one that can be given IV, especially in cases of DKA and HHS. Common examples of these kinds of insulins is going to be our Humulin R and our Novolin R. And then we have our good old intermediate acting insulin, also known as NPH, neutral protamine hagedorn. The way I like to remember this one is that the N stands for not too fast, not in the IV, and not clear. Medications in this category is going to end in N. So this one actually takes a little bit of a nap before it starts to work, meaning that it's gonna have a slower onset and it's gonna stick around a little bit longer. It's often gonna be used as basal background control, meaning that we're gonna be giving this kind of insulin with another insulin. They're gonna work concurrently. Typically, we give this twice daily in most regimens. So this medication can be mixed with regular insulin. And you remember how earlier we were talking about it being not clear as part of our memory trick? That's because NPH is cloudy. If we roll it gently before we start drawing it up, it actually becomes cloudy. When mixing with regular insulin, remember clear before cloudy. We're going to do regular insulin first and then NPH. So when is this medication active? When will it begin? Typically, you're going to see it become active around 1 to 2 hours. It's going to peak somewhere in that 4 to 12 hour range, and it's going to last way longer, right? 16 to 24 hours. When it comes to administration, subcutaneous only, we are not giving this one IV. We typically give it before breakfast and dinner. And common examples of this is Humulin N and Novolin N. Now we've got our long-acting insulin. These are our steady eddies. 
they are going to work gradually and provide 24 hour background insulin without any big peaks. This means that we're going to have less of a risk of developing hypoglycemia and more predictable blood sugar control. This insulin is going to start somewhere between one to two hours. Remember, there's no peak with this one. It's just going to be very steady. It's going to maintain that awesome steady level and it's going to last anywhere up to 24 hours. The reason why we say that is because Lantus can last up to 24 hours, but Levomir usually is lasting about that 20 hour mark. So again, this one is only gonna be given subcutaneously, either by syringe or pen. We're not putting this one in an IV, that could be detrimental. And common examples of this, of course, is our Lantus and our Levomir. The way I like to remember these types of insulins is when it comes to Glarglin, which is Lantus, I like to think of Glacier. We're gonna have a very slow release. Same thing for our Levomir, the other name for it is Denimir, meaning determined. It's gonna stick around for that 20 hour mark. So pro tip when it comes to these as well is that our Lantus is gonna form crystals under our skin that are gonna dissolve really slowly. And when it comes to our Levomir, Levomir is gonna actually bind to albumin and it's gonna slowly release over time. That's why these guys don't peak like we see with other insulins. And then lastly, we have our ultra long acting insulins. These are our marathon running insulins. What they do is they're gonna create these little depots underneath our skin, where you think of them as like a little insulin warehouse that's gonna deliver hormones steadily up to 48 hours. These guys are gonna have the same start and peak time like we saw with long acting insulins, where it's gonna start one to two hours and we're not gonna see a peak. The only difference here is how long they last. Their duration can be up to 48 hours. As always, this administration is gonna be solely subcutaneous, and a common example of this could be Traceba, also known as Deluptec. I like to think of this as Deluptec means durable depot. It's gonna start slow and last forever. Now let's talk about insulin regimens when it comes to feeding our body right. Think of insulin therapy kind of like meal prepping for your cells. It's all about timing and balance. Your body releases insulin in two main ways. First up, we have our basal insulin. This is gonna be a slow, steady release that keeps your blood sugar stable between meals and overnight. And then we have our bolus insulin. This is gonna be that quick burst of insulin right after a meal to handle that incoming sugar from your food. So think about it. When somebody has diabetes and their pancreas isn't working appropriately, we step in with insulin regimens that are gonna copy the natural rhythm as closely as possible. So this is why you're gonna hear it called the basal bolus regimen because this is the gold standard. It is the most physiologically accurate insulin plan. So with your basal insulin, this is gonna be your long acting, ultra long acting, and sometimes your intermediate acting insulins. These are usually given once daily at bedtime and sometimes twice daily depending on the type that we're giving. For example, Lantus, which is our long acting insulin, can be given at 10 p.m. to keep our blood glucose stable overnight and in between meals. And then next up we have our bolus insulins. So these are gonna be your rapid acting, short acting insulins taken before meals. And it's usually gonna be given somewhere in that 15 to 30 minute mark of eating. These are gonna be used to manage that post meal sugar rush, also known as post perandial glucose spikes. So an example of this could be Humalog, which is our rapid acting insulin, is gonna be given right before breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Three meals mean they're gonna get three meal bullish shots. So most clients that are on these plans are gonna be given at least one to two basal injections and three bolus injections per day. That means that they're gonna have a total of somewhere between four to five injections daily. Now that we've reviewed the five different types of insulins, let's test your knowledge with the information we learned.
crushed it, bestie. Now drop a comment below with the insulin tip or trick that helped you the most, and your advice might help boost somebody else in need today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so that you never miss a chance to gossip about anatomy with me again. Head over to nursechungstore.com where you can snatch up this PowerPoint and any other goodies that we have to offer in the store, and I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!